Hi everyone. A very warm welcome to our fourth consecutive session, MSME Finance, uh, facilitated by BFC from Zurich on Thursday every second summer. So the topic is digitization of MSME finance. And six weeks ago, during our first session, we discussed the topic from a standpoint um, that established the digital transformation as a journey, not just as a project. And our second session focused on digitization of financial services and business processes. And two weeks ago, our last session, we discussed the importance for the whole team to buy in of a transforming organization. And today, finally, our topic is making digitization happen through smart partnerships. So imagine you are asking yourself about the why and how of a partnership in business. And you do this while being on a safari when you suddenly see this. An ox packer sitting on a buffalo. What is he doing there? First, he's eating insects um, because there are ticks on the buffalo he doesn't want to have on his big back. And the second is the ox packer is also providing an early warning system to the buffalo in the form of a hissing noise which the bird makes when predators are near. So the partnerships we will be discussing today they are for sure more complex than this one. But one thing we recognize is common. Stable partnerships, they are always based on compatibility of values and objectives between partners. And they aim to keep a balance between costs and benefits for all partners. How to make that happen, we will discuss in the next hour between our four panelists and our global audience to this session connected from over 30 countries. Let me introduce now to you, Peter Fabian is a C-suite fintech and finance professional with over 16 years of experience in various executive and consulting roles in emerging markets and in developed countries. Peter holds a bachelor's degree from Princeton University and an MBA from the School of Business at Stanford University. Peter, thank you very much for making time to join us today from Berlin. Thank you for having me, Michael. It's my pleasure to be here today. Great. Now, Roland Coulon is a senior finance executive with 17 years of work experience, including in Africa and in Asia. And in addition to his experience as CEO, business and risk manager, he has also served as a head of partnerships as an innovative financial service provider in Myanmar. He holds an MBA in engineering from Ecole Centrale Paris. Roland, thank you for connecting with us today from the south of France to talk about the do's and don'ts of building a smart partnership. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to be with you all today. Great. And I move forward, Amit Garg is a solution designer with over a decade of experience in developing products and partnerships for digital development solutions in emerging markets. And he holds a Master of Science in Development Economics from School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Amit, thanks for being with us today and we look forward to your case study on uh, Bank MNO MTO partnership with a crazy number of total nine partners involved. How you made that happen, I'm not sure. Uh, but I hope you will, uh, you will explain how, we, how you made that happen. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Hello, everyone. I am happy to be here and looking forward to our discussion. Super. And now Andrei Taranushenko, who is a senior lending consultant at BFC and has on his back over 15 years of experience in implementing various MSME finance projects, mostly in the Eurasia region, in both internal and external, so consulting roles. Andre holds a master's degree in accounting and audit from Kiev National Economic University. And he will should share today with us his experience in launching a digital marketplace for an MFI that also involves partnerships, of course. 
Andre, thank you for being connected with us today from Kiev. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mikhail. Hi to everyone. Good. Uh, my name is Mikey Cotton, which you know me already. I'm moderating this session for you from Zurich. And in my normal life, I'm a consultant in MSME and Agricultural Finance at, at BFC, and I'm also the managing director of BFC. My pleasure to be here with you also. So now we start, as usually, our agenda with a poll. And I'd like to ask the poll to come up. So we, we see here the question, how do you rank the importance of partnership as a critical success factor for digital transformation in your domestic market? So while the poll is being answered, I will move on and explain a bit about how you can reach us and uh, how we structure the session. So at the bottom of the Zoom screen, you have a comment window. You all know that. And in that window, we would like you to ask your questions and we hope to get many of them and comments during the session. And of course, outside the session, you can always reach us through our corporate website and uh, by emailing us, you find this information in the chat window um, below on the bottom of the screen. And now let's have a look um, at the poll. So um, we can end the poll. So importance of partnership, 60%. So we have the right people on board. 60% think it's very important. 30% it's important and neutral. So obviously partnerships are important in digital transformation. And probably we can already say they are much more important in banking and finance than they have been 10 or 15 years ago. All right, good. With this, uh, we move on. So we have on this slide, making digitization happen through our partnerships, our topic, three blocks, developing partnership ability within institutions, our first block. The second will be working out an effective partnership arrangement. And the third one is living in a partnership. And we start with the first one, developing partnership ability within institution. And I'd like to give the word with no further delay to Roland Coulon, who will share with us in a very short presentation, the do's and don'ts of building a smart partnership. Roland, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. And uh, welcome everyone again. I think we can immediately move to the to the first slide, which is the next one. Um, yes, excellent. So just as a startup, I would like to um, remind everyone that we can easily put partnerships into two different categories. And uh, the first one you can consider is we can call it multiple to one or, or business as usual partnerships. And the second one being one-to-one -one smart uh, strategic partnerships. In, in the first case, what I'm intending to, to, uh, to put into that uh, category are the, the, the case where you have multiple partners to extend your existing services. So if we look at non-digital services, you can think about uh, partnering with uh, cash-in, cash-out agents uh, for agency banking, for instance. But in the space of um, digital services, you can think about adding bill, um, bill payment services with different billers. Um, and in, in that category, you can also distinguish between uh, whether the, the different partners have a similar structure services, then you should use a standardized approach. If different services, different structures, you may need to segment and offer differentiated offers. And in that, I invite you, if you go, want to go further, to look at opening your APIs for your partners to consume your API. You have a link at the bottom of the, of the table. For the next category, which is probably more interesting to more, um, most of you today, uh, I will move to the next slide and explain with an example how we built a successful partnership in Tanzania with, a, with an aggregator when I was bank CEO. The, um, here, I would like to really emphasize that the key for a successful partnership is always to start from your customers. Don't start from the partners, don't start from the partnership process, whatever. 
start from your customers, define a clear value proposition you want to offer to your customers. In our example, intrabank transfers, wallet to bank, and bank to wallet transfers and access to cash. Once you have clarified your value proposition, then you can move on to obviously define key objectives and measures for success. I've put a couple of examples I'll, I'll let you read. But th the point is that then you can move on to think about whether you need a partner or not. Um, and uh, if you feel that you need a partner, then you, you should define obviously selection criteria. Let me uh, look at the examples here. They, they are quite um, important. I would, I would put as a first uh, criteria, like-mindedness. Uh, do they focus on the same customer segment? Do they have similar objectives? Will they be committed throughout the life of the partnership? Then obviously expertise. Can they deliver better than you can or, or someone else can? And, and uh, last but not least, obviously the price and the requirements coming from the partner. Once you have your, your selection criteria clear, then, then you can look at uh, different options, different partners, assess their strengths and weaknesses um, on your own, but also with them. Identify also the, the gap in resources between the different teams. Um, don't forget to look at your uh, data and client data, QIC for instance. Then once you've identified all these points, you can review if you need to do, uh, you need some prerequisite to be put in place or are you ready to start? Don't forget to restart from the beginning and if necessary, iterate the process to make sure that whatever partner you have pre-selected and whatever you, you are planning to do is in line actually with your original value proposition and, and, and uh, objectives to, to serve your customers better or your customers. And as, as, as a small um, takeaway for you, I've put uh, on the next slide some, some uh, more bullet point style uh, do's and don'ts. Uh, I may mention one or two and then let you read them through and, and come back with questions later. But um, I would say that on the, on the, um, on the do's, I would really um, encourage you obviously to start with the customer uh, and to ensure also buy-in from the management. Um, on the don'ts, I would really encourage you not to be afraid or hesitate to engage with your partner in case at the beginning or later on something is not clear, something is not going the way it should be. Honesty on your own, but also on, on, uh, in between will be key. Thank you for now. Thank you very much, Roland. Um, very, very concise, very clear. Um, I have a simple question. Uh, what can I do if I need a partner? Um, for my digitization project or whatever as a financial service provider, but I cannot find one. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michael. That, I think that's a very good question indeed. Uh, I, would, I would think about two different options. The first one would be to look for technical assistance funding from uh, outside and probably look for an external international expert to help me bring the expertise into the country and probably within my institution. The, the other alternative I would immediately think of is actually look at a partner that is close to you and, and, and is interested in the same service or value proposition you're looking for and, and try to develop it together mm -hmm. to create, to create the, the service you want to deliver. Thank you. Thank you. That makes good sense. Um, before I, um, I ask two questions to Peter now um, uh, to give a comment to us, um, I'd like to remind the audience, uh, you can ask your questions uh, now um, and always uh, in the uh, Zoom bottom window for comments and uh, we'll try to pick them up immediately. So if you have any questions to Roland, uh, please feel free to ask them anytime. And now, um, Peter, I have a question to you from, from your perspective uh, on partnerships. Uh, what, what is their role in digital transformation? Anything to complement to what Roland uh, just said to us? 
Uh, I, I think Roland presented an amazing framework and uh, he definitely mentioned that, you know, the right thing that you need to focus on the customer. And, uh, you know, we often forget you, you go to a partner and you might have an idea, but, you know, uh, the partner will probably have a very different idea. And even if you share the idea upfront, uh, you know, things change. Yeah. So the partner might change their strategy. Um, you know, their mother company will suddenly decide that there are different objectives. And uh, so, so it's kind of very important that you align upfront. And, and mm -hmm. you know, you are just not excited in the first, you know, month or so, and then uh, things change, yeah, especially when you're dealing with big partners and, you know, they have a change of management, they have a change of objectives mid-year, uh, you don't know. So it's extremely important to kind of keep that focus on the customer throughout, yeah, mm -hmm. and, and kind of be very clear with the partner that, mm -hmm. you know, that this can't just easily change in three months. You know, if you're in it, you know, you have to be in it for the next six to 12 months or whatever is the duration of the partnership. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's especially important, you know, for the smaller player, um, yeah, especially when you partner with the mobile network operators and so forth with the big partners, um, uh, they, they are bigger. Yeah. So obviously mm -hmm. they'll have totally different priorities. They will move at different speed to you as a, as a kind of innovative bank. Uh, so you need to find someone, you know, with similar size and that kind of, I would say applies to the digitization efforts. Uh, so always try to find a partner that's, that's kind of aligned to you in terms of size, objectives, incentives, uh, who's worked with similar um, companies like yours, you know, there, there's some past experience. So it's not going to be kind of learning experience for everyone. Yeah. Because there's, mm -hmm. there's just, no need to reinvent the wheel. Um, you know, let's say, for example, in the mobile financial services or digitization projects, uh, this has been done in multiple countries, geographies. So always try to find someone who has some experience. And if you don't have it yourself, you know, it, it's kind of easy to acquire, uh, you know, to reach out to, for technical assistance and so forth. But don't, don't kind of try to reinvent the wheel uh, because you might succeed, but you know, you're going to spend a lot of resources doing mm -hmm. it. Yeah, there's just no need. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, you both confirm. Um, I think I heard that also from Roland that soft factors play quite a big role. So with the chemistry, the fit and those things, um, uh, it, has to, it has to feel right. But um, uh, looking, I mean, the evil is in the detail always. Uh, so if we, we look at the risks of partnerships, and I mean, we know that um, a partnership not or yes, uh, a large share of digital transformation projects, they just are challenged or failed even, a very large share found by research. Um, so how can we manage these risks of partnerships here? And uh, would you recommend um, to anyone considering a partnership, Peter, to do it maybe in smaller steps? What, what is your view? Oh, definitely. I mean, when you look at the slide we are looking at, there is this MVP, yeah, and that's an extremely important word, uh, you know, the, the minimum viable product or minimum viable prototype. And that's extremely important for everyone to kind of keep it on their mind. You know, what are, what are kind of the low hanging fruits? What is the shortest path to having something tangible? Yeah, because everyone always underestimates the complexity of everything. And it's, it's very important to, to kind of, you know, aim for the version one. Yeah, it's kind of quick mm -hmm. and dirty, but, you know, trial of the first five, 10, 100 customers, you know, how can we get it done? Uh, because if you kind of uh, promise uh, wonders and, you know, thousands of customers here and there, and it, it just, you are never able to get there because the complexity, you know, everyone's just going to get really kind of disappointed that, uh, you know, they will start looking at different things. Yeah, and then you will mm -hmm. lose a lot of steam. So, so it's definitely important to, to keep it realistic and not aim for, you know, taking over the, the world or your country, you know, in terms of customers but really uh, start small mm -hmm. and be very, very fast. Yeah, that's also very important, you know, especially if you're the smaller player and you have a big partner, you know, how can you actually get to trying this out, have a trial, have something launched? Yeah, so in version one, you know, what, what is kind of the shortest path to that? Yeah, you always have to be really aware of it. Otherwise, it's just very easy to, to just, you know, uh, mm -hmm. add a month here and there. And, and you know, for a big, uh, let's say for a big telco, big partner, a month here and there is just normal. Yeah, they're in business, you know, they have the mm -hmm. steady cash flows. That's, you know, not a big deal for them. They probably think in terms of three months, six months. Yeah, but mm -hmm. for you as a bank, uh, you know, it, it really hurts. Yeah, because you, you are spending a lot of energy on this, a lot of resources, and you kind of announce to your people. You're have a partnership mm. and you know to your investors and board and then suddenly you know a month or two delay everyone's going to keep asking why and the pressure is going to be much bigger on you than on the other partner yeah so you have to think about yeah. that too so yeah. so keep it realistic very small step very fast if you can it's difficult yeah okay good thanks um uh, very much peter so we, we get two questions thanks a lot so um i'm reading them and uh, roland please get ready to answer them um in a in a quick fashion, so because we have to move on shortly already. Uh, the first question comes from Aida Muzagic. 
And the question is, what kind of background check or due diligence is recommended to complete on the potential partner? Roland? Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Aida. That's, that's also a very important uh, question. Um, so I, I would suggest to actually do reference checks uh, with, uh, with other partners, other customers of, of your partner and uh, ideally ask directly the, the partner to provide a list of uh, uh, other partners they are working with, uh, but also do your own background analysis to find if there are others that he is trying to hide, uh, if there is nothing uh, hidden and, and, and no bad news. Generally, that's a very good sign. Thank you very much, Roland. And uh, I move on with the question two from Ramesh Sharma. What is the challenging confronting every business partnership. So what are the challenges probably confronting every business partnership and probably how to deal with them? So, mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, that's, that's, uh, that's a big question. <laughs> uh, thank you, Ramesh. Um, once again, uh, le let me highlight the importance of, of keeping the customer at the center throughout from the beginning to end, uh, but that's not the only one. Uh, maybe if we go back to, to my slide, uh, one, one challenge that I have noticed is easily for, forgotten in the excitement of building a partnership uh, is the, the risks, but uh, what's uh, beyond risk is uh, consequences of risks like frauds and, and financial losses. Uh, that's definitely something you want to discuss and, and uh, clearly uh, agree on very uh, early. In, uh, in the partnership to make sure that whenever emergencies happen, you're ready to uh, address them, but also uh, address them jointly with, with your partner. Okay, thank you very much, um, Roland. I think with that, uh, we, we are just on time in our time tracking here. We move uh, straight forward to the next block. So thanks a lot for the first shot, Roland. And the next block, um, we start as usual, working out an effective partnership arrangement with a poll to our audience. And the poll is to uh, everyone here. Now, what are the selection criteria you will look for when cho choosing a partner in the future? So please indicate your selection criteria now here. And we can return to the poll um, in a couple of minutes, but already, um, give the word to uh, Amit and before that I would like to remind everyone again that we very much welcome your questions during the speech all the time in the uh, question answer window below on the screen. So I see we have um, a good participation here. I think we can already shortly close the poll before Amit you start. Yeah, I think we can close it and can share it. So the selection criteria, the audience thinks expertise is number one. So the partner should know um, about the related topics. Then we have strong commitment as the second one, um, reputation, shared values, price, learning culture comes less. Um, well, um, that sounds a little bit a little bit different to me what uh, we discussed in the first one, which is good. So we have something to think about. Amit, because this is your block, um, do you want to give it a first comment? Uh, basically, are you surprised by this or you think you expect exactly that outcome? Um, hello, everyone. Um, I am, I think, in the same boat as you, little surprised, uh, but at the same time, uh, this is what you would kind of expect when you're looking for a partner, you want them to have the expertise, you want to make sure the price point works. Like it's, it's very technical, you know, our expectations are often skewed towards technical parameters, which is very interesting because um, as you heard, uh, you know, Peter and Roland speaking, and you will also see the example I will be sharing. In the end, of course, the technical factors were critical. They are, you know, your hygiene factor, you need to have them right, but you also need, um, Mm -hmm. This additional factor, which are the soft factors, which are mm -hmm. not necessarily very technical things like uh, compatibility, uh, shared value came up, which is which is great. Learning culture, 
like these things really really make a difference so maybe not so much when you're uh, inching the partnership i'm sure uh, um, andre will touch that again when you're living in the partnership like this can you know this is like bad relationship versus a good relationship like after a while you have to be living in that partnership for, for mm-hmm. you know, years so the softer aspects are quite critical in in more practical sense so we will be seeing some of those aspects as we go along with our um, uh, with our views and discussions great amit that's um i think a good stage setter for your part for your presentation so um you have a partnership case on a mno mto partnership with financial service provider yeah and um uh, the floor is yours amit we much look forward to your case all right thanks let's uh, let's look at this case um uh, please move to the next slide um you know before we get into detail let's see where this sits our challenge here challenge generally is how and when do i use so called smart partnerships that fits my objective primarily but i know partnership is you know it's a two way relationship it also has to fit other other partners uh, um, value proposition as well and let's look at this example how one partner triggers a chain of partnerships and in a response you have a service that serves the customer as well as offer value to the partner involved in the whole partnership so this is a case coming from far away land a small island country in the south pacific where there is a local bank and they have very ambitious challenge they want to capture 5% of the remittance market remittance is the sole source of um the economy there is 21% of the gdp and they see big pies and they see they are far behind at the same time there are grim realities the bank is very local uh, they do not have a mass market digital channel they do not have experience of dealing with the correspondent banking directly uh, no um, digital banking experience before beside of course they offer a close i mean can you please speak a bit louder uh, yeah, or sure. closer to the mic i'm not sure we can hear okay. you thanks Let's see mm. if it improves yeah thanks yeah uh, so yeah i was going back so the bank also at the same time has a very small balance sheet so they are not they are not in a position to go for a very heavy cap- capital expenditure into technology at the same time their close partner are the local uh, traditional money transfer operators who are offering products at much cheaper cost than what other banks offer so this bank itself cannot do, start a price war so how do you gain the market share with so much kind of adversity on your side let's see how that smart partnerships came into play to help them boost their market share from 1% upwards towards 5% next slide please uh here you will see this is the end result this is not what it how it started as i think uh, um roland was also mentioning that it started slowly as a version 1 so what they did was their target customer is diaspora group that is living in new zealand so they partnered with a credit union which was faster than partnering with a commercial bank because of regulatory compliance and the union that was serving primarily the geographies where the diaspora lives and what they offered was through the credit union customers are able to transfer fund in new zealand dollars the money stays in new zealand dollars but what acu does is transmits an electronic message which is decoded by the local bank in 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 the country which then honors the transaction to the recipient but the physical money didn't move the money was kept in reserve in new zealand dollars which was very it added host of revenue to the bank because they could use that for their export settlements as well as remember they were setting the exchange rates so of course the margin on the exchange rate were larger than the cost otherwise so that was their step one to get that partnership in place independent to any other partnerships so they can start you know their version 1 and then later on they extended a separate partnership with the uh, mobile network operator digicel uh, where half of the adult population is on their mobile wallet platform and bringing that partner to the bank offering a product called easy bank they were now instantly able to access that half of the adult population and since on the receiving side they were already connected to a different partnership with the with the new zealand entity to a customer now you can actually get money from international sources into your wallet it was a 30 minute settlement process not so real time but a lot faster than what was in the market and the whole whole service is 40% cheaper and interestingly bank 
spent the least possible capital expenses and got the larger footprint uh, not to mention the whole cash uh, cash merchant network of the of the mobile network operator at the same time the whole uh, digital infrastructure of the credit union to access and later on in their version 3 they extended the partnership to another platform clickax which then partners with the the likes of world remit transferwise to then offer the similar offer a similar experience uh, to customers that were outside of New Zealand as well. So now suddenly, now in current stage, if I am here in Germany, I can get money to somebody in Samoa in 30 minutes in their wallet. And that costs 40% cheaper than the market rate. So that's how this partnership model evolved with individual partnerships smartly put together to create a whole structure in the end, adding value to the customer. So this is kind of one example where you can see different partners coming and creating a win-win solution. And um, yeah, I think I'll leave it here for audience to kind of see if they have some questions they wanna you know, get into some specific details. Uh, thank you very much, Amit. Um, uh, can, you, uh, can you say how long took the whole process? So from the start of uh, saying we will partnership and then get there uh, to have the partnership and what were in the process, basically, the, the critical, really critical points, were there any critical points where you said, well, we were close to maybe fail with this, but we had to go over it and we made it this way. So maybe there could be hidden stones also, yeah. <laughs> no, you are right. You are, you know, pressing the right nerves. Uh, well, um, time scale, uh, time-wise, Okay, the first group of partnerships, that was the core essential that was identified, okay, we need to start somewhere. Um, as Peter was saying, we knew that, of course, initial response was, oh, let's have the big, big end goal. But then we went a little bit or more of, okay, let's follow a little bit more of agile and lean approach and got the first partnership for one service, which was just from bank to bank transfer, and it took three months which was a little bit lucky because already, I think Roland's point, the selection filter out partners that would have taken much longer. Hence, um, you see the result partnership was not with a commercial bank, but with the credit union. Uh, the first product to get the first generation of service out, it took three months to get the whole model, like the three large partners and the backend partners. Uh, now the products are in there towards the end of their second year and all the partnerships are live. So in that way, yeah, it's a gradual, it was a gradual process. In terms of some critical milestones or, or, or uh, speed breakers, there were a few, um, actually a lot. Uh, of course, one was regulatory issues. How do you, you need regulatory approvals to set up a matching account? Remember, the bank was circumventing uh, 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 SWIFT transfers. There was no SWIFT transaction happening and there was no money moving outside of the international borders, electronically or otherwise. So they of course needed a special uh, approval that this partnership is in compliance and things like that. So that was a uh, preparation part, um, manageable hurdle. The biggest hurdle was uh, inching partnership in the domestic market. Like the bank had to really, or we as a team had to really work hard to show value to Digicel that, hey, there is actually mutual value for you to partner why would they partner with the smallest bank in the country versus uh, doing their own business? And so that convincing took some time, but since there was actual value for them because the mobile wallet was offering a mono product with banking partnership, they were instantly able to offer a host, host of products. So that kind of sold the thing to them. Otherwise, perhaps most people think about it. Technology was never a problem. It was just all the problem was, or the challenge, not more challenge was in partnerships. Technology was never an issue. I think that's, that's a very refreshing uh, concluding remark on that question. And uh, I moved to another one. Uh, and actually, we got this question from the audience. I had it on my paper as well. So it's about the exclusivity. I read the uh, full question here to make sure we mm -hmm. got from, the, uh, from an undisclosed participant. And the question uh, three is, when a bank MFI enters a partnership with a third party, especially uh, if such partner is supposed to interact with the customers at some point, which is sensitive, of course, yeah, should then a bank or MFI request exclusivity, uh, not allow the partner to enter in similar relationship with other, with, with uh, the competitors of the, of the financial institutions, yeah? Um, uh, and um, 
how how can you then make sure you um, uh, you don't kill your partnership by the exclusivity? So what can you say about that? How did you do it? <laughs> okay. So this is actually a really, like all practitioner face that question. You want to, of course, from a partner, one partner wants to have exclusivity. The one who is in more of a, in the power equation on the power side wouldn't want the exclu exclusivity because they would want to partner with everybody else. So how, where do you strike the balance? And you yourself, if you are on the uh, lower power equation side, then you are in a very precarious situation. The answer lies in it's a very customized problem with a customized solution and really you have to respond to the market. You cannot fight the market forces. For example, in the example that I mentioned, market allowed for exclusivity to run for three years. Partner was happy to sign a three year exclusivity agreement because since this was the first pro such product in the market, and for everybody, it was a little bit of a playground testing field and they were all okay. Anyway, nothing is moving in the digital remittance market. Three years, we will all learn and move somewhere forward. And then we reevaluate, which were acceptable to everybody. In other markets, I know, for example, my home country is India. Uh, exclusivity is out of the question. Every, like the, the ecosystem is so well connected. You don't, people don't even want the exclusivity there because you have access, to, everybody has access to everything. The market has moved from low grounds to higher grounds where the players that are offering better products and better user experience are the ones that are capturing the market share or getting the customers. So it's not uh, in the partnership model, then it's more about your value proposition of your service and how you're offering that service. So as I said, like the market, you have to really see where the market is. There's two different examples. Sorry, good, great. Thanks, Amit. Um, uh, we're getting more questions, which is great. Uh, so uh, one is about the question four, if you have seen maybe uh, the personal habits in partnership business. Uh, so why do most partnerships fail? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, uh, so on the risk side, personal habits, maybe the culture, um, I think maybe a short answer would be great. Uh, from Ramesh Sharma, we have this question. Thanks for the good question. It is a very good question and it's kind of the hardest question to answer. Like there is no one answer. Like why would most partnerships, uh, or in many cases, let's say not most, but many times partnerships do fail. I would, one point, I, if I were to give one answer, I would uh, relate back to what Peter and also Roland touched upon I think it's the expectations. Many times we are looking for that big apple at the end. Uh, we want that big goal that, you know, uh, one million customer, this partnership will like transform the business, transform the country. And we're always only looking at that and not necessarily the small steps. Okay, can I get somewhere tangible in two months and keep the momentum? And that it's, so the, the answer or the challenge lies in the approach, not necessarily in the partnership and goal. And that in my experience, 12, 13 years, that's often is missing. Institutions do not give enough weightage to the process of small tangible steps. And that's where then it just gets the larger goal is so complex to achieve in one go. And then you just need one external strike and then suddenly its momentum is gone, cash flow is gone. Now we see with COVID, we had million plans and suddenly you have a coronavirus situation and your large big partnerships are thrown out of the window because priorities have changed. So again, I would retrade plan small step tangible outputs along the way and you will get to the big apple in the end. Yeah, that sounds very down to earth and actually reminds me about uh, uh, maybe um, a good principle uh, for fitting for human relationships in general. I mean, being mm -hmm. at a friendship or a marriage or whatever. I mean, uh, it's all about this, the, uh, the small things to come together in the right pace, uh, basically to make things work. It's not about the one big, wow, now we have it, yeah? It's yeah, building yeah. a house, basically, yeah? Yeah, exactly. And not starting a rocket or something like that. All right, um, one more question. Uh, we have from Bilal Jan Hagen uh, to you, Amit. Mm -hmm. Were there regulatory requirements that need to be addressed? I can imagine you can speak long about that, but try to be short as you were before. Okay, uh, no, thanks. That is also a very practical question. There were, that was actually the first step. First step was identifying the partners, but the identification and the selection process using some of the criteria that Roland mentioned 
already considered some of the regulatory um, requirements. Uh, in this particular case, the biggest hurdle, of course, was getting the approval from the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, as well as from the Central Bank of the country, Samoa. Um, they, since it was a unique model, they had, they requested personal, uh, personalized in-person presentation. Uh, what helped was that the institution involved were all licensed and regulatory entities with very clean records and good reputation in the market. So there was no need for additional due diligence. It was in the end just kind of convincing the central bank. What also helped in this case was both central banks are offering regulatory sandboxes. So what really helped us to push this case under the sandbox approach and get a three year conditional approval to test um, test the system. And also there was agreement that we gave in saying, okay, for the first 1000 customers, of course, the aggregated responses and the transaction records will be shared, uh, masking the details. So the central banks would feel uh, comfortable in their compliance reports and stuff. Um, yeah, beside, I think the regulatory sandbox really helped in, in getting this off, off the ground. Okay, good reference to the sandbox. Uh, we are a little bit running over time, but that was uh, um, uh, very super interesting, your case. Uh, um, before we move on, uh, I'd like to ask Peter uh, to give us a few concluding remarks. Anything you would like to add on this case presented by Amit? I think it's it's a very kind of common use case. Yeah, you know, you have a you have the bank, you have the network operator, you have remittances which are difficult, and you know they usually come in smaller amounts, very frequent, very regular. Uh, so it's a kind of very common use case. I'm sure many of our participants have seen, and uh, there's always some different flavor and variation. Yeah, that's where the partnership kind of comes into play. It's like how are you going to which which route are you going to go? And as was discussed here, uh, you know there's some good use cases kind of you know to 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 watch out for and you know to look at before you start anything so uh it's it's something everyone i think as we discussed before everyone should do is, is look at the different countries look at different uh banks and uh network operators have done this yeah because you know we're in a commodity business mostly and and anything you think about somebody's already done somewhere and, and really study did it work did it not work why did it work what kind of bank was there what kind of telco was there um you know what other partner was there to kind of push it uh, and the remittances, who were the competitors and so on. Yeah? So try to learn before you kind of think, oh, wow, I just invented a new way to the remittances um, because, you know, uh, a lot of people have been there, done that. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, do your research before you, um, uh, you think uh, you have to move, right? Start the thinking first and then yep. the doing. Thanks a lot, Peter. Uh, great. Um, so we move on. Uh, we have to go to block three now. Thanks a lot for block two, Amit. Uh, block three um, uh, is to Andre, and he will give an example in living in a partnership. But before Andre starts, I'd like to ask um, our support team again to pull up the poll. And uh, the poll, the last poll now today is how will you look <laughs> to avoid pitfalls associated with partnerships? Yeah, so dealing with the challenges. So, um, what is your experience, uh, dear participants, in this webinar? Uh, please answer now. And I think we can pick it up during the call. So, <clears throat> um, and uh, give uh, the floor to Andre because we are a bit running over time, but Andre, I think uh, we'll, we'll be able to catch up. So um, Andre has a case study launching a digital marketplace for an MFI. Andre, how did that go? And uh, what are your lessons learned for all of us? Um, yes, uh, thank you, Michael. So uh, before uh, sharing more uh, details regarding this um, marketplace with uh, MFI, basically I want uh, to uh, discuss the issues which uh, were um, arised by, by uh, this poll. Uh, can you please switch to the next slide? This is about false uh, challenges. Uh, in today's discussion, moreover, my colleagues raised uh, these questions too. So uh, based on uh, the partnership implemented by BFC in several markets, I will also add a few of my observations regarding uh, how it is to live in a partnership when it is already in place. So referring uh, to uh, this particular slide, when uh, your minimum viable product developed, so you have product, process, uh, objectives and targets uh, could seem quite achievable and realistic. However, in reality, there is no smooth way to success. As you can see here, and as you know, the road could be paved with uh, different constraints. So, um, for example, 
at some point, uh, your capacity or capacity of your partner will not be enough to ensure proper performance. For example, if you expand the scale of the business. Uh, when making projections, uh, I mean your financial indicators, numbers, uh, the resources required from each party should be also considered upfront. I would say even literally. So, for example, when your um, project, um, uh, uh, when you project or expect 20% growth of sales, then respective efforts required from partners to achieve these sales have to be ensured when such projection is made. Second uh, is um, about leadership. I remember when implementing a uh, value chain partnership between the bank and agricultural uh, processor in Central Asia region, the strategic targets defined in the top level um, were clear and reasonable, I mean by top managers, but due to the operational management was not engaged in the initial process. Some uh, technical issues were not considered and this caused some challenges, delays in the implementation. So it is quite important to, to have at least two tire governance and ensure that um, uh, they are alignment between uh, each other. Uh, so um, third, this is about business model. Business model that works today and makes their results tomorrow may require adjustment. And um, any um, decision regarding possible adjustment should be based on the analysis of uh, recent results, indicators, trends. So this may relate, for example, to sales volume, to change in customer re uh, retention, to change in competition environment. So in any case, this approach, analysis, measurement, then conclusion should be constant and quite cyclical. And um, the last, but um, uh, yes, but not least, uh, is such a sensitive issue. Uh, it's the uh, right table as the uh, exit strategy. Uh, it could happen that uh, one of the partners doesn't fulfill the obligations or underperform. It is difficult to take the decision when so much resources invested, when some relationship arranged. So, uh, therefore, in order to everyone play the same rules, these rules of the cooperation, uh, they should be uh, clearly set beforehand. It can be, for example, um, indicators uh, of performance, of engagement, sharing costs between uh, parties and uh, so on. So the problem has to be discussed. Uh, ways of mitigation are to be defined, but in case the situation has not been changed, then it is time to, uh, to leave uh, this partnership to change the uh, partner. Um, as for uh, the marketplace that uh, was um, implemented within the MFI, uh, could you please switch to next slide? Yes, thank you. So speaking about living in a uh, partnership, I also want to use uh, this uh, showcase. So uh, it was implemented by BFC and one of the leading MFI in Caucasus region. Within this project, a marketplace was developed, uh, which linked vendors of different products, customers, and financial institution financing purchase of these products. In this particular case, living in a partnership uh, implied uh, living in a constant evolution, not only like evolution of relationship of these partners, but evolution of product, process, and uh, technology. So initially, example, yeah, target, uh, target segment uh, was the farmers located in rural areas. The credit process combined the features of, uh, let's say, tablet-based lending. So loan officer demonstrated available agri uh, inputs to uh, customer, added them into the card, formed loan application, and promptly informed about decision made uh, by centralized underwriting unit. When the process and product was tested, the marketplace expanded and picked up um, various new features. New segments, new vendors, retail uh, segment, consumption products, possibility for customer to apply online, scoring-based uh, decision-making, and many others. So um, basically, uh, to make a conclusion regarding um, living in a partnership, I would like to Emph uh, emphasize that um, living in a partnership is the time associated with both risks and opportunities. 
This is true. So risk could be mitigated in case most of the uh, challenging issues were identified upfront and considered by parties upfront, but opportunities could be reached if at least two conditions are met. Interests of all parties are satisfied and all parties seek to constant evolution of their product. Uh, I think that is all in brief uh, regarding uh, living in a partnership, but probably have um, questions or we have questions from um, the audience. I would like to answer them. Thank you very much, Andre. Very concise. Um, I think before we come to any questions from the audience or myself, um, we can have a look uh, together at the poll. Uh, so if I may ask to share the poll. Um, and uh, again, to remind, we had asked about <laughs> pitfalls associated with partnerships, how to avoid them. And um, uh, as you can see here, Andre, uh, we have uh, uh, a leader established clear objectives shared by all partners. I think we heard that already before um, uh, from other speakers, so not very surprising to me. But then we have also things like uh, comprehensive criteria for performance and progress evaluation, um, and the others are more or less equal. Um, uh, related to your case, is there anything you'd like to comment uh, uh, to this, Paul? Mm -hmm. um, so um, um, let me um, let me select one uh, option uh, which uh, took only uh, twenty percent. It's um, new features partners to an exi uh, existing agreement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, here, um, I just uh, wanted to um, uh, provide the example regarding this marketplace uh, with the MFA uh, that initially initially it was one or two partners in this uh, market uh, place. But when you establish the principles and rules of work with one partner, with two partner, uh, when it is tested, uh, when it is processed, and when uh, basically it is working, then you may adopt uh, such approach and such rules to uh, other uh, partners because you have this background, you have this uh, experience. And uh, I think, uh, yes, uh, risk of adding new uh, partners exists, but if you have uh, this experience, if you know how to deal with this, uh, adding new partners may contribute uh, to quite a large, I would say, benefits, advantages, and improvement of your uh, product uh, overall. Thank you very much, Andre. That makes good sense. So um, let's see if we have any questions from the audience here. Since we're getting some in, um, so we'll start it from those. Um, let's see if you can answer that question here. Um, uh, Ramesh Sharma is asking question six. What percentage of businesses are successful in all over the world? Uh, any data regarding and sharing? Uh -huh. uh, I meant to the partnership business. Okay, maybe I can give that a first shot. I mean, we didn't look into um, uh, partnership in particular, how many partnerships are successful. But when we prepared for this session, um, I found um, a research done, I believe it was McKinsey, and um, two, three years ago. And not surprisingly, I mean, uh, that's the job of consultants uh, to show everyone how challenging everything is because they also want to do some work. So they said 85% uh, respondents, I think they interviewed CEOs, uh, were saying that um, the digital transformation basically failed or were heavily challenged, yeah? So a very high share. And um, I mean, I remember that we looked this up a couple of years ago on strategy. So um, on strategic projects, uh, we probably also had something like a figure, like I think 30% uh, failed, 30% heavily challenged, mm -hmm. and 30% only successful. So that is all similar kind of uh, thing because it's a change management project, digital transformation change management, probably. Um, so most of them go wrong, basically. And that's yes. probably why um, we have also a lot of participants today again. They want to know what they can avoid, not to get it wrong. And uh, what can you say in regard to this case now, your, your case with digital marketplace? You also had vendors, external vendors, and uh, the operation was not so big also. I mean, how um, did you feel um, the dealing with risks was done? What would you do differently if you would be in this project again um, now? Um, yeah, uh, I think that um, basically um, 
uh, it was uh, first of all uh, it was quite a um, relatively long time for launch minimum uh, viable product i think that we were uh, preparing uh, this minimum viable product for quite a long uh, time we can start earlier we can start testing uh, this uh, mm -hmm. product uh, earlier because uh, when you uh, have all these theoretical projections regarding how it works uh, how it can be uh, perceived uh, by the customers yeah uh, then um, it, it is quite uh, difficult to, basi to basically make uh, some um, real mode uh, testing. Uh, if talking about uh, successful um, cases, I would also I'm, I, I was thinking regarding other uh, examples from uh, markets where we implemented uh, different partnership uh, schemes, and I think that um, not of uh, all uh, not all the um, partnership were uh, successful, and uh, the reason could be. Uh, I, I would uh, I would say uh, I would add uh, two more uh, reasons. The first is that expectations regarding outcome, our expectations were uh, were too high. For example, we uh, projected the one volume of sales, but the partner uh, basically cannot process such volume of sales, such uh, volume of customers. And the second issue is that uh, what I uh, saw uh, about partnerships which were um, implemented by other parties in other uh, project, uh, projects, uh, it's that uh, sometimes uh, partnership, they try to, um, to figure out some scheme which is uh, unnatural for uh, the uh, customer. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, if you have, for example, supplier and if you uh, uh, have a party which finance the, uh, the needs, the products which uh, uh, that uh, is um, uh, selling by this, um, which is sold by this um, supplier, then uh, it is natural scheme. But if you try to put in this uh, scheme some artificial elements, some additional services, which is actually are not required uh, for uh, the customer, then such kind of difficult partner, uh, partnership scheme could be not uh, perceived and consumed by the market, by the customer. Thank you very much, Andre. And um, I think uh, with this, uh, we almost come to an end of the whole session because we want to um, uh, finish on time as we started on time. So um, instead of a summary, what I will do now very quickly is um, I will ask the audience to also uh, uh, see how you perceive this. I give four quotes, okay? And each quote belongs to one of the speakers here. And uh, you type in uh, the comments uh, in, the, in the comment window, basically, whom you think it was. So the first quote is, um, do your upfront research and other use cases in other countries before you start uh, actually um, moving uh, in implementing something. So um, who, who said that? <clears throat> So I'm, I have to move fast because we don't have so much time. Uh, so while you think and type, it was done by, was said by Peter. And um, the second quote, uh, we choose the credit union as a partner because we were thinking they were faster as a small organization than a bank could have been. I really, that stuck in my head. That comment was made by, yes, by Amit, right, thank you. And uh, then um, we have a third one. Uh, the interest of all parties should be well served to make the partnership successful. And uh, risks at the same time also have to be understood and balanced. Uh, who said that? Might be more difficult to uh, remember. That was said by, <coughs> by Andre. And then it's clear who's missing. <laughs> Start any partnership from your customers. I think that was a very good statement made by Roland exactly uh, at the very beginning of our session today. Um, all right, but um, for those of you um, who want to um, reassess the session today, we will share the podcast uh, very soon in a couple of days on our website as we do always. So we'll be editing podcasts and also you can tell your colleagues that you can find um, uh, this information uh, on our website who couldn't attend. Um, so um, let me thank, before we come to an end, 
very, very much um, give a big hand to our great panelists, to our four speakers. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all of you for being with us today and spending your time in preparing for the session and being the session. Uh, it was uh, super to have you here. Uh, big thank you to all uh, the audience and with this uh, to the support team, of course. And I have to announce the next and the final session of the Ask BFC webinar series on digitizing MSME finance, which will be in two weeks from now, 10 a.m., September 24th, managing data in the digital age. Super interesting topic, super hot topic. We have again a great panel. So please join us again or tell your colleagues who are uh, breaking the heads with data, data management, data storage, data processing, that all will be discussed within one hour very effectively. And with this, I say on time, bye-bye to everyone from Switzerland, from Zurich, and look forward to see you all fresh and healthy again in two weeks from now. Thanks a lot for being with us today. Bye-bye from BC. Take care. <laughs>